Our guest today is the former Under Secretary of Navy during the Kennedy administration. Following the assassination, he uh, wrote a very delightful and very enjoyable account of his friendship with uh, President Kennedy. The book is called The Pleasure of His Company. There's coffee over to the sides, uh, by the way, in case those of you would like to get some. This is going to be very done on a very informal basis. And following the uh, presentation, there will be a uh, question and answer period. Now, despite the fact that he's a graduate of Stanford, we'd like to welcome <laughs> Mr. Paul Fay. Thank you. Uh, Aaron said this was going to be a very informal gathering, so in the nature of being very informal, my glasses just came apart. So uh, this gentleman down here is working on this, so we'll uh, start in on a very informal level. I will say that uh, it's very, we appreciate coming down here, particularly on this weekend of the UCLA-USC basketball game, and I hope to have the opportunity to go over some of the fine points of the substitution rule with Edgar Lacey. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, John Kennedy loved Southern California, and he particularly liked, uh, well, he loved, really loved all of California, but he particularly liked it down here. And I think uh, one of the uh, typical of an incident that happened to him down here was when he came, uh, which I think points up his political aptitude, uh, he said, whatever the situation is, make sure you always smile. And as you know, a politician has to so many occasions go to factories and different places and Maybe some you'll go through and you'll be shaking hands with everybody going through and the fellow will say, I don't want any part of you, Kennedy. And he'll just smile. So the image goes to over the camera if anybody's there. If anybody from the distance sees it, they get the impression that everybody's for him as he goes through. Now, I don't know that you remember when he came out here, oh, it was about 62 or 63, and he went out, uh, he was out at the beach at Santa Monica, and he went swimming. And there was a picture came out, and he, he went out, and he thought he was going to get out without be, being seen. And then he got out and he was spotted and the crowds moved in and uh, they started to get around him. The Secret Service men were trying to separate the, the crowds and they couldn't, couldn't get through and finally they, he just carried the crowds into the Peter Lawford's house with him. And there was one lady grabbing onto him. She had a hold of his swimming trunks by the back <laughs> and his left arm and he was, the picture came out of him smiling. <laughs> and, uh, as he said, uh, to everybody else, it looked like that we had a real rapport. And my, and my comment to this lady, will you please take your fat hands off my body? <laughs> but at least this is a, uh, uh, gives you a little feel for his, his love for Southern California. But I would, uh, I would like to, if I could, uh, go over several points. I'd like to tell you why I uh, wrote a book about John Kennedy. I'd like to uh, go over the events leading up to the publication of that book and how I wrote it for somebody who had a great deal of difficulty with English at Stanford. <laughs> and uh, problems to leading to publication, which uh, was, uh, uh, as you can imagine, you write about a national figure, it is a difficult thing to do. And last, a little bit about JFK. Actually, the decision to write a book was uh, one as a result of a, a conversation I had with the president in 1963. We are up at uh, my wife and I, and uh, who is here today, and who will be introduced later. If things start to sag a little bit, we always get the bride to stand up. <laughs> and uh, but we are up at uh, Squaw Island, which was a, a house that they had rented up at Hyannis, with uh, our youngest child and my wife. And uh, after the president, I had we'd been playing golf, and we, he came in, and we came in, and he said, "How would you like to uh, uh, come down at seven o'clock? Lyndon is uh, dropping by on his way to the Scandinavian country." And I said, I'd love to. It's all right if uh, the bride comes down, too. And he said, fine. So at about uh, five or ten minutes of seven, we were down in the living room. And uh, the president came down a little bit before seven. And then uh, the vice president came in with uh, George Reedy, who was then his administrative assistant. And I'd never seen the two men together. I uh, know Lyndon Johnson hadn't been the, his, uh, his mentor, you might say, when he was in the Senate, being the leader of the Senate, and John Kennedy being somewhat of a junior senator. And then when the first time I saw the two, I, I figured it all, it would at least be on a kind of a man-to-man -man basis. In other words, that they would have an easy relationship, an easy rapport. But it really didn't work out that way, and it surprised me because the vice president was really quite ill at ease with the president. 
And this was something which is unusual because the president was a very easy person to be with. He, uh, he was informal by nature. He, he didn't like the uh, rigid uh, formal meetings. He'd much rather be in a, really in a meeting like this where he could talk informally to the people he was with. So uh, during this conversation, why the question of the vice president uh, who was going to the Scandinavian country, he asked if it would be all right if he could go uh, drop by Poland. Well, I wasn't quite put, you know, I'd like to drop by Poland since I'm over there. <laughs> but uh, he said, I, I would like to visit Poland uh, if, it, if you think it's advisable. And uh, the president thought for a split second, he thought, well, he said, maybe it, he, at first he said, has this been cleared with the State Department? And he said, well, I didn't want to do anything in a serious vein until I got your okay. And the president said, I think maybe at this time it wouldn't be a good idea because he said, uh, you're going to the Scandinavian countries. If you go to Poland, it'll take away the impact of your visit to the Scandinavian countries. Well, then the vice president left. And this was, I guess they were together there for about uh, 45 minutes. And when he left, uh, uh, I came up to the president and I said, you know, I was just amazed because I said the rapport between the two of you. And he was intrigued as any person would be. He said, well, what do you mean? I mean, uh, I said, well, the fact that uh, Lyndon Johnson was ill at ease with you. And uh, he wanted to bring it all out. He wanted to get it exactly what we described the whole saying exactly as it was. And then he said, you know, Redhead, he said, you've had an exposure of the presidency that few people have had. You've got an obligation to write it. Well, I started to write it then, and I thought that I'd have a lifetime, uh, really, with the president to write it, and really the happy things. And I guess at the time, this was in August of 1963, and uh, as you know, in November, uh, his death, and but prior to that time, I guess I had about five or 6,000 words written and things that we'd gone back and discussed, very light, happy things. And then after his death, I, uh, I really stopped writing it. I think that everybody who was in Washington at that time, uh, the life went out of government, particularly those who were close to the president. And the, I, and the first was uh, to get out of Washington. And then, of course, uh, as time passed, you realized you had an obligation and a job that you were in. So then uh, I didn't do anything about writing until July of that year, 64, and we were over at uh, David and Ann Brinkley's for a barbecue on a Sunday evening. And there was somebody there who was a writer, and uh, a lady, and uh, we started to talk back and forth. And I told her that I started to write this book, and she said, you've got an obligation to write it. You should go ahead and complete it. So I started to write again, and I told Jackie Kennedy that I had started to write again. And actually, Jackie gave me some excellent advice, because I'd started back in the Pacific, and I might have still been out in the Pacific because there's something fascinating. The farther it gets away, the more important it seems. And uh, she said, you ought to come up and write about the Washington years. And then uh, she said something which I thought was very feminine. She said, please don't forget me, and, uh, which I thought was very sweet. I thought it was, uh, it was nice. And uh, well, then, so I went ahead and I wrote. And then on New Year's Eve, I'm back again at the Brinkley's having a a real bash there on New Year's Eve, and there are, uh, the same lady is there with uh, her husband, and but her publisher happens to be there, and she brings me across to meet her publisher. And uh, so then uh, they have a great uh, underground system because the next day or two days later, why I was contacted not only by his publisher, publishing house, but by McGraw-Hill and Harper and Row. And then I got a little bit concerned that here I was uh, embarking on something which, uh, no question it has import because you're speaking about an international figure. And so I spoke to Bob Kennedy about it. And I mentioned that I'd been contacted. In fact, I had about 15,000 words then. I let him read it. At that time, it was a story uh, which uh, was about, uh, there was a story in the 15,000 words about Bob and Ethel Kennedy. And at that time, it was all right. In other words, it wasn't something that he objected to. Later on, he objected very strongly to it. And as a result, I took the names out of the story but left the story in. But at least he said uh, that he thought that uh, it was appropriate that I did write a book. He said that uh, you're the only person that, who has known the president all through the war years, had had parts and uh, took uh, part in his campaigns, was a member of his administration in the Navy during, the, uh, during his administration. And he said something which, uh, he said, you know, you ought to make a lot of money at it, uh, which I haven't made a lot of money, but it hasn't been uncomfortable. And uh, then he uh, also said you should stay with the, uh, the major issues. I said I didn't feel that this was really my fort. As Undersecretary of the Navy, you're kind of like the executive officer of a ship or the administrative officer. You do the administrative work. You really don't get into the policy as much as the Secretary of the Navy. 
So I pleaded guilty, and I mean, I pleaded, I didn't want to write about the major issues. And then he said, I want to have the last word. At that time, there were about, oh, I guess, 10 or 12 people in the room, and uh, Bob Kennedy is a very persuasive person and a very forceful person. And at that time, I, the weakness in my story is that I did not take him on right then and say, no, I wanted the final word. So uh, I said, well, I, uh, well, you know, that can be worked out, I'm sure. And uh, actually, we did work it out about uh, six months later when I was at his house and I was writing, and we uh, brought the issue up, and I said that I had to have final word, that I'd go along with whatever he uh, asked if it was reasonable, but I, as Arthur, I had to have final word. And he said, you mean as head of the family that I don't have the final word uh, on this book? And I said, anything that's reasonable, you'll have, but I have final word as the author. Well, then uh, he had advised me to uh, go to Harper and Row as a publisher. Harper and Row, as you know, published uh, uh, John Kennedy's uh, Profiles in Courage and the Enemy Within. And uh, my associate editor that I dealt with was Evan Thomas. And Evan Thomas is, uh, is also the man who handled uh, the Manchester book. And he's also uh, Norman Thomas's son. And, uh, but I mean, he doesn't, uh, whether he has, I've never gotten in a pol political discussion with him as to where he stands with, uh, with his father. But he told a very interesting story about his father and uh, I mean really about Joseph P. Kennedy and our relationship with his father. It seems that when the uh, Profiles and Courage came out that Mr. Joseph Kennedy, and this was when John Kennedy was a senator around 1955, Joseph Kennedy got on uh, Evan Thomas saying, you're not doing enough publicizing this book. He said, you're not getting in enough magazines, you're not uh, getting enough radio spots, you're not doing enough to, uh, to really promote this book, you've got to do more. And this went on and on until finally Evan Thomas had to get a hold of the senator and he said, Senator, I just can't get my job done. He said, your dad is ringing up once a week, getting on us about the fact we're not doing enough about your book. And the senator said, well, I'm going to be coming to New York next week. He said, let's have lunch and we'll discuss it. So he came up and uh, Evan, they had lunch and Evan told him the story about the problems with his dad and uh, John Kennedy said, you know, Evan, he said, uh, you have a prominent father, don't you? And he, Evan agreed, and he said, uh, you don't always agree with him politically, do you? And he agreed, and he said, you don't always agree with him on other things, do you? And he said, that's correct. He said, but you love him. And he said, well, I have a prominent father. I don't always agree with him, but I love him. And uh, as Evan Thomas said, after that, whatever uh, Mr. Kennedy wanted to do was perfectly all right with him. <laughs> but anyway, they, they did, uh, uh, in other words, the, the book was uh, written, and to write a book, and in fact, I started at that time, and uh, for any of you people who aspire to write, who have had a problem getting your compositions done properly and having people say you never can do it, here's the living proof that it can be done. Because I really had uh, problems with, uh, you know, writing properly, and uh, in fact, I'm not sure that I've got it mastered yet, because the San Francisco Reviewer, when he reviewed my book, he said, Mr. Fay said at the beginning that he was neither a writer or a historian, and 262 pages later, he proved it. <laughs> but I will say that uh, uh, writing it is, uh, I wrote 3,000 words a weekend because I had to work during the week, and I set this limit, and it started out really to be very poor uh, when I began. And then the more you write, I think it's like anything else, it, it starts to become easier, it starts to become better. And then have somebody who is very good who can correct you. I had an excellent fellow by the name of Mike Land, whose uh, son or daughter goes to UCLA right now. And uh, he went to UCLA. And uh, this is, uh, he gui they'll guide you, and pretty soon you'll begin to understand the places where you've made your mistakes and how you can do better. Well, anyway, as the book progressed, and I got near the end, then I became very concerned that there was I writing a book which was too personal about an uh, international figure. And uh, so I went to uh, Jackie Kenny to ask her to clear my book. And uh, she said she didn't want to read the book that Ken Galbraith was the uh, unofficial Kennedy censor. So I sent the uh, book to Ken Galbraith, and uh, amazing enough, there was uh, one thing that he asked me to take out of the book. He said, I don't think if your book's going to be serialized in a magazine, you ought to leave that line in there where Jackie Kennedy called some girl a bitch. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but otherwise, it, it, it was all right. I mean, if you want to leave it in the book, it's perfectly all right. And I might say that she had every justification in the world to call a girl a bitch. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, well, anyway, so the, 
the book, uh, uh, after Galbraith read it, uh, I had four, uh, four other people read it. And then when I got down to the final stages, then Bob Kennedy would not pass the book. In fact, he wanted to take out about 25% of the book. Uh, I refused. It became uh, a very traumatic thing between the two of us. In fact, I'm happy to say that after a year and eight months, uh, we was in San Francisco two weeks ago, he rang up to say hello for the first time. But, uh, which I must say that I greatly appreciated. But uh, when I got down to the final issue and the book had to be published, uh, then Jackie Kennedy came in and we went over line by line on the book. And she had about initially 34 different things that she disapproved of and we really only came on an impasse about four or five. But uh, I thought she was uh, excellent in her judgment. But people have asked me, uh, why would you publish a book uh, if you claim that you are such a friend of the families or that you were you want to do the right thing why would you go against their wishes and publish this book and i said i felt the real reason for publishing the book was that if john kennedy and his goals that he stood for were going to live he had to be known as a human being because if he started to be you know molded into bronze or the uh, lead or whatever they make statues out of why uh, he would suddenly become somebody that almost didn't live almost like a legend that wasn't here but he was such a warm human person that if everybody could communicate that, well, if this fellow did this, well, maybe I have a chance to aspire to greater heights. And this is really the basis uh, of my uh, writing the book. And now if I'd like to, if I could, I'd like to speak about John Kennedy himself as an individual. You know, dealing somewhat with the, the lighter sides and the uh, heavy sides. Incidentally, he uh, definitely did not believe in uh, long talks. And uh, in fact, he put, uh, uh, he felt that the length of the inaugural speech was just about the, uh, the length of a, uh, a speech should be. But he also, uh, I've got at least 13 minutes to go, it says <laughs> <laughs> But he loved to tell a joke. And uh, I think that on almost every occasion that uh, he got, he, he would, in fact, he had a joke that, uh, if you remember when, uh, at the time when they were speculating as to who would be his running mate, whether he would uh, continue with Lyndon Johnson, and supposedly, and this is all fictitious, but at least it was a joke that was around Washington, that Bob Kennedy had come up to him and he said, uh, Jack, you've got to have Martin, Lu Martin Luther King as your running mate on the next ticket. And uh, the president said, Bob, he said, I'm sorry. He said, Martin Luther King's not going to be on the next ticket. He said, the country's just not ready for a Baptist. <laughs> and, uh, but actually, the, uh, it was here in Los Angeles when he had to make his first major political decision, and this was the decision of choosing his vice president. And up until that time, up until the nomination, when he received the nomination, he was really working for John Kennedy and for the state of Massachusetts. But when he was no nominated, why then the burden of really saying who he wanted as his uh, vice president running mate was put on his shoulders. And we had dinner up here. Mr. Kennedy was given Marion Davies' house up here on, uh, in Beverly Hills, a fantastically beautiful, um, uh, I guess, Spanish-type home. And uh, that, I was there for dinner that night, and I was sitting next to the, the nominee and uh, John Kennedy didn't have what you'd call great tennis, I mean, great table manners. Uh, I mean, it, and I'm not saying he had poor table manners, but he really got to the meal to get the job done. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then go on. And he was obviously uh, uh, harassed with the decision that had been made because he had made and had not been publicly announced that Lyndon Johnson was going to be the running mate. And uh, he kind of was uh, quizzing the people around him, asking, you know, you know he was just upset about it. His father, who was seated at the end of the table, he said uh, uh, to Bill Battle, who was from Virginia and who was our ambassador to Australia later, he said, now, Bill, you know the ins and outs of Southern politics. Uh, uh, you must admit that Jack made the right choice of picking Lyndon Johnson as, a, as his running mate. And Bill Battle, without hesitating, he said, that Mr. Kennedy, he said there could have been no one else. He said at this time, he said with a religious question, with a young man, with uh, what, what some people are going to say inexperienced, to have somebody from the South, somebody who has been in the Congress for a long while, he said, this is the balance he needs. He said, the right thing was done. And it was amazing enough to see John Kennedy really kind of let down and relax, feeling that possibly the right decision had been made. But I'll say that uh, 
being a, you know, after the election, after the president's elected, to suddenly find that somebody who you consider one of your closest friends uh, as president of the United States, it's really quite an overwhelming experience. I'll have to tell you the first weekend that I was in uh, Washington, I was with the president on the, uh, during the inaugural weekend, and on uh, Saturday after the inaugural ball, he said, uh, come, to, uh, come over about 10.30 and we'll go to church together. So uh, when we got in, uh, I got to the White House about uh, 10.30, and uh, when we left to go out the south entrance, why, the uh, president, I let the president go first, and he jumped in and sat in the seat behind the driver. And uh, I got in the seat uh, on the right-hand side in the rear as we headed out. And as we got out, everybody generally at the southwest entrance would wave at you as you went by, uh, hoping to wave to the president. There I am, seated on the right hand in the rear, and there's kind of a, you know, not too, <laughs> not too sure waving at me. And the president's remark was, he said, uh, I hope this is an indication of support for the new undersecretary of the Navy and not an early waning of support for the president. <laughs> but uh, we went to mass, and uh, we got in mass, and uh, as the president, nothing had changed. We got in there, and when it came time for the collection, as usual, there was not a penny in his pocket. And I was about to go in for a dollar bill and give it to him, and he said, no, no, he said, I want a 10. He said, I want the country to know they've got a generous president. <laughs> and, uh, but we, uh, we, came back from, uh, we came back from Mass and went back to the uh, White House, and he said, uh, and you've got to imagine that here's a young man, he's president of the United States, and he said, how would you like to go out and see the offices? And Teddy was along, and we said, God, great. So the three of us walked over there, and it was really almost like the country had taken a holiday, or the nation of the world had taken a holiday, because you could see some Secret Service men kind of in the background in different places, but you really couldn't, uh, you felt like you were all alone. And we went in the office, why, there was nothing there but the uh, desk and a chair. And uh, the president sat down in the chair, and he spun around, he looked up at me, and he said, Paul, do you think it's adequate? And uh, <laughs> I said, any minute, Somebody's going to walk through one of these doors and say, all right, you three, out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, uh, as I think it's been publicized that the uh, first, say, 100 days of the presidency or before the uh, Bay of Pigs really was kind of a honeymoon uh, for the president. It was a wonderful period and a very exciting period. And then when the uh, Bay of Pigs came, it was a, uh, just a crushing blow to the president because it was... He had taken the advice of the military, he had taken all the information that he thought he should use, and he would made the decision to go in uh, because he felt that uh, he had been advised that they would not need anything more than uh, just letting the uh, Patriots go in. Well, as you know, it turned out they weren't equal to the job, and the, they really needed the military power of the United States to support them, and the President didn't give it to them. And uh, he felt that he not only uh, had, a, had put a, uh, a bad image on the country and also hurt the country's prestige around the world, but he felt he had hurt his own administration in a very bad way. They felt that they'd lose some confidence in his administration. In fact, we were driving out to Middleburg maybe about two or three weeks uh, after the incident. It was a gray, foggy uh, Saturday afternoon. And we went out through that southwest gate, and maybe there were two or three, two or three people there, because they had no reason to believe that he was going to be going out at that time. And uh, they hardly even waved at him, and he said, if anybody thinks I'm going to run for this office again, they're out of their mind. And uh, it, it just was, you know, the, the, the whole weight of the decision fell on his back. And even the, I don't know, this is, uh, I don't know whether you can remember back to 61 when they had the Berlin blockade. And Anita and I were over there for dinner with about, I guess there were about five or six others for dinner, and the president was late. We were to be over there at 7.30, and it got to be about 8.30, and he hadn't come from his office. So uh, Jackie said that we'll all go into dinner, the president will be over soon. And so we were halfway through the meal when he came over, and I was seated on his left. And he sat down, and you could just see the strain in his face and the flushness in his face. And he, you know, he turned with a certain bitterness. He said, I hope that you've enjoyed your meal. He said, because I've been over in that office, he said, with a decision made wrong or right, he said, the whole world could go up in flames. So it really, uh, when, you, when you criticize the man who's holding the highest office in the land, just think of the trauma that he goes through and the struggles that he has to go through on an everyday basis on decisions which we criticize and cut apart rightfully or wrongly, but still the man has to die for almost every decision that he makes. And I know that if there's a book you might have read Seven Days in May, and it's by Fletcher Knabel, and uh, on one weekend up at the Cape, he was given this book. 
and it's a story about the possibility of the takeover of the uh, administration by the military. And the president read it, and he came back the uh, next day, he read it that night, and he came back the next day, and he said, uh, you know, he says, an interesting uh, theory. He said, I can see that if you have a young president, and you have a bay of pigs, that uh, the military will get a little bit restless. And he said, if you have another bay of pigs, uh, the military could think this man isn't equal to the job. And he said, and if you had a third bay of pigs, there's no question about it, they'd feel they had to take over for the good of democracy. And he said, I don't know what form of democracy they'd be exercising, but he said, I'll tell you, it won't happen on my watch. And uh, it didn't, as you know. And of course, then the missile crisis came up, and uh, to see this man's action during the missile crisis, and a great tribute to the military, because the military knew for uh, 10, 12 more days before the president went on television that the missiles were in Cuba. And uh, they had to be thoroughly verified and it had to be kept absolutely silent because if the word leaked out before his uh, television conference or his television appearance, why the Russians could claim ahead of time that uh, there was going to be a propaganda campaign put on by the president claiming that missiles were in Cuba, it's untrue, it's just another one of the United States propaganda programs. Well, as you know, they didn't leak it out and the president went on television and told them they're going to have to go out. And uh, it, he was really in control. I mean, from then on in, he was president of the United States and, uh, in my opinion, started to exercise the responsibilities uh, of the presidency in a fashion that as an American citizen that I was, uh, you know, felt that he was doing it to the fullest. But I've got to say something about the humorous side of the president because he had a, he, uh, he was a very humorous man and saw the, the humorous things in almost everything. In fact, uh, on the first year, uh, January 1st, 1962, he was having a National Security Council and John Conley had then resigned to go back and run for governor of Texas and I was acting secretary of the Navy. And we went over to the cabinet room in the White House, and my seat was next to J. Edgar Hoover against the wall. And uh, there were a lot of other people against the wall, such as the chief of staff and, and uh, all the heads of the department. The cabinet officers sat at the main table. And we, I was there about 10 or 15 minutes early, and so then I, and J. Edgar Hoover came in, and we started to chat. And then the president came in, everybody stood up. And the president started to his seat. And he spotted me over next to J. Edgar Hoover, and he walked over to J. Edgar Hoover, and he said, uh, Mr. Director, do you know the Undersecretary of the Navy? Now, I'd met J. Edgar Hoover once before, and uh, so we weren't close friends. And he said, oh, Red Fay and I are old friends. And uh, the president looked him right in the eye and says, obviously, you never looked up his record. <laughs> <laughs> then, then went over and... Uh, and carried on really a memorable uh, National Security Council meeting, discussing all the problems that they'd had in the first year and the difficulty of, uh, you know, against the Soviet who could go into a country and take it over and mold it to the form it wanted to, but we had all levels of, of democracies and our allies weren't exactly their form of government. It necessarily wasn't what we had wanted, but at least this was the way with, we had to make our way in life. But I can remember on another incident, we went up to the Naval Academy and he, he, he he loved the history of the Navy. He loved the Navy and everything about it. And he'd gone through the museum and he was asked to speak to the plebes. Now these are the first year boys, and this was the summer. They're there for maybe about five or six weeks before they, uh, to find out whether they really have the stuff to stay on and go through the arduous training of the military. So the president, uh, they were all drawn up at attention in front of Bancroft Hall, and the president was asked to speak by the uh, superintendent of the Naval Academy, and he got up and uh, and his informal manner, he said, well, why don't you all stand at ease? Well, these young fellas uh, hadn't never heard an informal order like that, and nobody moved. And he leaned up to the microphone and looked at Admiral Kirkpatrick, and he said, Admiral, I guess that comes later in the course. <laughs> and, uh, and I will say that uh, they, all, they all started to laugh, and suddenly Admiral came up and put them at ease. But he was really uh, a most brilliant man, and I think this is the thing that in fact, he said it without uh, being egotistical. He said that he felt that anybody who ran for the position of the presidency had to really be a cut above the average. And he said he had to have a great appreciation for history because everything that you dealt with in your relationship with other countries, you really should know what their background was, the way they've responded and acted over the years past. And he felt this so strongly about the people in his own administration to read. Like, uh, I think that... Barbara Tuckerman's book would have been a bestseller, but I don't think it would have gone to the heights that it went, The Guns of August, if it hadn't been the fact that John Kennedy felt that every military man should read that and take the lesson from that book. 
and he took speed reading himself. And actually, he uh, when he went to Washington as a congressman, he, he said his reading was somewhere around 12 to 1400 words a minute. And he took the speed reading course and got it up to about 25 to 2600 words a minute with almost total comprehension. And uh, in fact, I'll have to tell you a, a humorous story about it. We were coming back from Camp David, and I took the speed reading course myself. And uh, when I got back there, I ran it from about 450 up to about 850. <laughs> but, uh, which is a 100% increase. <laughs> and, uh, so we were coming back on the helicopter from uh, Camp David, and all these newspapers were laid out on a table in front of him. And the uh, president, it was really wonderful. On the weekends, he'd kind of get away. He'd have his briefings in the morning, but he would really kind of get away with his family and relax. But come Monday morning, it was back in the harness again, and he'd read these newspapers. And he came to an article in the New York Times by Scotty Reston. And he, you know, he'd fold the newspaper lengthwise like this, and he'd just read down that paper. And you could see him getting madder and madder as he went down the paper. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he turned the page, and then he read it down, and then he handed it to me, he said, read that. <laughs> and uh, so I grab it, and here I'm going about, you know, 1,200 words a minute, getting about that much comprehension, trying to pick a date and a name here and there, these eyes watching me as I'm going down. <laughs> and I'm, I'm halfway through, and he says, what are you trying to do, memorize it? <laughs> uh, well, I, could, I, I really could go on and on, but... Uh, I, I'd like to say what I really think John Kennedy's heritage is, and uh, in fact, it's interesting that Walt Rostow, who is now one of uh, the present president's uh, top advisors, in fact, his top advisor in Vietnam and a real hawk, as uh, uh, as he when we, we were this was oh maybe about four oh maybe six months after the president's death, and we were out at the then Secretary of the Navy Paul Nitz's playing tennis. And uh, we were uh, showering, and this is after Lyndon Johnson had gotten so much of his legislation through. And uh, I was, uh, you know, kind of down the dumps about it, and I said, you know, it's, uh, it's really um, so sad that John Kennedy couldn't have done something in his legislative program, at least one-fourth as much as uh, Lyndon Johnson's been able to do. And uh, Walt Rastow really fired up. He said, what do you mean? He says, that's not the important thing. He said, anybody can write legislation. He said, but what you have to do is, he says, you've got to move and lead the country. He said, John Kennedy was a leader. He said, he would have gotten all the legislation through. He said, but the thing was that he had the imagination of people and they believed him, and believed him. And he said, and this is the important thing of a president. And actually, they believed in him because he had, John Kennedy had this tremendous feeling that democracy was really on the rise, that it really was the way of the future, and that we were going to outlast and we were going to overwhelm communism as a way of life. And I'd like to read a few lines which were actually, I believe, written by Teddy Roosevelt, which John Kennedy loved and believed in. The credit belonged to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who knows the great enthusiasm the great emotion and spends himself in a worthy cause, when at best knows the thrills of high achievement, and if he fails, fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. Thank you very much. opportunity you'll have to go to classes and those of you who want to get some coffee um, that that time and afterwards we'll come right back in about a minute or two and ask some questions and answers. <laughs> Were you able to do it? Well the screw will patch on the bottom. Yeah so it's in many, but it's very loose. Many, many things. Perry Hurst. Well, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Could you autograph the book for I'd be delighted. Just to like the cat. Channel 7 News. Very nice to see you. Do you have a couple of moments we could talk to you over here? Can we do it after the question and answer period? Uh, we have a film time. Well, why don't you ask the first question? Can mm -hmm. you do that? No, I want to talk to him on a, on a different subject, not on what he's just been talking about. Yeah, but, we'll, you know, we better do that after the question and answer period. Are you going to take a 15-minute break, are you? No, we're just taking about a two-minute break, and uh, after that, we're just going to it's, uh, the question and answer. Harry. Harry first, 
You know, I'm going to be ashamed to give you my 75 cent edition of the sheet autograph. Would you like some coffee too, by the way? No, this is this is great. Thank you very much. <laughs> they send this to my album. All right. Why don't we just start right now? And if you have any questions, why don't you just raise your hand? This gentleman here. You mentioned profiles and courage, Mr. Fay, and you mentioned the, by indirection, you mentioned the assassination. District Attorney Garrison has made some very serious allegations directed at the President of the United States and the Attorney General, Mr. Clark, to the effect that evidence is being suppressed, his investigation is being torpedoed at every turn. Why is Robert Kennedy unable to either read the Warren report or examine the assassination at this time? Uh, you all heard the gentleman's question, uh, and I know that UCLA has sponsored, I think, uh, put the crime to uh, uh, Roger Howard told me that uh, the US UCLA had uh, put up $10,000 for a study. Uh, and I, I want to go on record. I don't discuss the assassination. Uh, I don't like to go through it. Uh, I, it's something you have to make a study to become an authority on. There, uh, Mark Lane is was here. He's an authority on it. Uh, why Bob Kennedy doesn't do it, uh, I think it's totally Bob Kennedy's business. Uh, I think possibly that uh, to get involved in it himself is the most distasteful thing in the world. It's not going to bring back his brother's life. There are people who are in a position to uh, follow up on this, and I think time will, uh, if there's anything there, I think it'll finally come out. But I, I'm not, uh, in answer to your question, I don't know why he doesn't do it, and I'm really not qualified to even discuss it. This young lady back here. Well, well uh, when I, uh, uh, after the book was written and I got a payment from McCall Magazine, well, I sent back a modest uh, contribution to the library. In fact, I, I think she made a you know, bad mistake on that. She sent the money back, but I didn't think it was her place to send it back, and I think she regrets it now. But I sent the money to the library, not to Jackie, and I said this was the beginning of a series of contributions that I hope to make to the library. Uh, amazing enough that uh, it was quite some time before the, uh, you know, I got a letter back and then the money came back and uh, somebody had leaked it from the library because Herb Kane, a, a columnist in San Francisco, had the information and called me up about it and I said, please don't use it. And so that actually this didn't come out for about three months and I was down in Dallas and uh, one of the reporters on the uh, Dallas Morning News uh, asked me if I'd made any contributions to the library, uh, I mean, if I'd made any contributions as a result of the profits from my book, and I said, uh, yes, I had, and then I felt, well, then I felt if I'd left it there, it would appear that I was giving something which had been returned, so I said, but it had been returned, and that's how the story got out. 
Well, no, uh, as she put it, she said that when she returned the money, she said, no, see, there were about four or five things that I wouldn't have changed on the book. And uh, she said, uh, when she sent the money back, she said, you know, it would be hypocritical for me to accept the money since you know how strongly I feel opposed to your book. And that was the reason. This gentleman here. I wonder if you could talk about your experience in the Pacific World War II trade money. Uh, this gentleman asked me to talk about my experiences <laughs> in the Pacific in World War II. Uh, you know, that's a pretty full course <laughs> in itself. <laughs> no, I mean, it was, uh, you know, we were out there for 12 months, and uh, I think of the 12 months we were out there, you could total all the time they were under fire in 24 hours. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's race to wait. This gentleman here. This gentleman asked uh, President Kennedy's <coughs> views on Vietnam. Well, I have, uh, I, I can't say what John Kennedy would uh, do under the situation, but I have strong feelings about, I mean, I knew what he felt about it at the time when he was president. He was, uh, after the Bay of Pigs, uh, he had a totally different approach to the military than he had prior to the Bay of Pigs. He really kept them at arm's length. In other words, he felt that the military were there for one thing, for military action only that all the political and military decisions were made by the president and that by the president's advisors. And uh, so any time that he was approached about increasing the so-called advisors down in South Vietnam, why they really had to, you know, they had to go over and over again and on time and time again he refused to increase the number of advisors. Now, what he, uh, what he, I don't think that he would have ever let it get to the condition it is now. I, mean, I just don't, I don't think that he, he didn't believe that military action was the answer. He felt that the, really the diplomatic field and the, uh, uh, and this was the place in order to solve your problems, if they could be. Now, whether it would have worked out that way, God only knows. This gentleman? Were there any particular people that you think uh, President Kennedy modeled himself after? President this, this gentleman asked, were there any particular people that President Kennedy modeled himself after? Uh, I think that he had great respect for uh, a lot of people. He, he was a unique person because he saw so much good in everybody. He really, uh, uh, you know, you can say, why was Red Fay a friend of John Kennedy's? Well, there were certain qualities in me that, you know, that he admired, and uh, for that reason that I was a friend. I mean, they're well hidden, but they're there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he, he made a great remark. He really admired Thomas Jefferson. And uh, he made a great remark uh, when they, they had a group of uh, nuclear physicists at the White House for breakfast one morning. There were about 20 or 30 of these men there, the brightest men in the country in this particular field. And he said, never have has had such a great collection of intellect been gathered in the uh, White House at one time except when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he really, this was the respect that he had for this individual. But I think that, uh, he was his own uh, man. I mean, there was, uh, like with his father, he admired his father very much, but he had such different opinion on, particularly on foreign policy than his father did. This gentleman? Uh, there re were reports after the assassination that President Kennedy had thought about becoming a journalist or at least running a newspaper possibly after he got out of the presidency whenever that time might come. Did he, do you know if he ever sat down and wrote a diary or kept some personal comments about his time? I don't think he uh, kept, in fact, I'm sure he didn't keep a diary. In fact, on a couple of occasions, we were uh, aboard the uh, Honey Fitz, the presidential yacht, and a message came uh, about uh, ZM being killed in South Vietnam, and it really crushed him. I mean, he really was upset about it, and this is totally, you know, you get the impression from what you read that the CIA was in on this and that the president said yes go ahead well this was not true at all because I was there when it happened and his uh, comment was that bitch met him too and in other words he felt that she was behind it all that she had been the one that had gotten this, the country uh, so disrupted and so torn that uh, uh, you know this is what eventually led to his assassination but he had to write a message out at that time in answer to this because there was something come over the air and he had to write something. So he took a pad uh, uh, paper and pencil and he wrote this out, this message. And then he got on the phone and he read it over to the, uh, uh, to the man on the phone. And then he, he, I don't know, he stuffed it in his pocket. And then we were walking along the beach after we'd landed and he took it out. And he, it was in his way and he just dropped it. And I reached down and I said, do you realize that's part of history? 
And I said, you've just written a message which someday will be part of your, you know, your administration. And, you know, he thought of me, he said, well, maybe I better take it. <laughs> <laughs> and he put it in his pocket, but uh, I don't think that uh, he, uh, I don't think, he, but as to be a journalist, uh, he made a great uh, comment about, he felt that he ought to, uh, that he could be helpful as uh, in the, if, you know, as he said, if Bob or, or Ted are present, he said, I think that I'd uh, be helpful as the Secretary of State because I've had so much experience in this field. And then he said, but I don't know whether I'd enjoy being uh, Secretary of State on the lovable old Bob. Said in jest. This gentleman asked, what were his views on the office of the presidency? In other words, whether the presidency had enough power or whether it... Uh, well, basically how he was using power. Well, I, uh, the power, as you saw, his real use of the power and the first major use of the power was in the uh, missile crisis, uh, where he really was, the, it was the first time the two nuclear powers in the history of man had met so-called eyeball to eyeball. And this idea when the, you know, when you remember the quarantine when our ships did not go in, they did not shoot at the, uh, the tankers or the cargo ships, the Russian cargo ships. And this was all, as John Kennedy said, this was a language between himself and Khrushchev. That every move he made, he said he couldn't get Khrushchev boxed in a corner, he said then he'd have no other recourse but to go to war. So he, everything was done to try to let him get off the hook so that we wouldn't go to war. And so this was the use of the power. I think that he, he felt strongly that the uh, British had a, uh, a, in some ways a better form of government than we have because he, as you know in the British system, the people who are elected to office, not only do they have legislative responsibility, but they have an administration, an administrative responsibility. They, they head up, they might, you know, somebody will be elected as a, as a, what do they call them over there, a representative or opposite type of our, well, Royal opposition. And well, if he's a representative from an area in London, he also might be the undersecretary of the Navy. And he said, uh, and, you know, in one of his peaks, he said, I'd like to have those guys over in the hill I'd like them to try to run this government with the legislation they're giving you. And uh, he said, if they had a little responsibility for this, he said, uh, running the government, maybe they'd, they'd think differently about the legislation that they produce. This young lady. This young lady asked, uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, President Johnson was uneasy as vice president in front of uh, John Kennedy. Well, really what I attribute it to was because in, in those days, uh, Lyndon Johnson's strong part was domestic politics. And uh, this is really where he'd, you know, he'd spend his life in domestic politics. He'd really never, other than the legislation that came across the, his desk as leader of the, uh, of the Senate, why, he really didn't become involved. And John Kennedy's part was international uh, politics and the relationship with other countries. And since he was going into an arena, and I just don't, didn't think that he understood quite what I the impact was going to be if he did go to Poland. So I think he was just uneasy about the whole question, but he wanted to go. I think it was, yes, I think it was the, because uh, he's not uneasy. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman here. Uh, he did. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I'm really taking a line out of my book, but it was interesting when, the, uh, when this question in the uh, spring of 63 came up and there was speculation in the paper as to who his running mate would be and who he'd run against. And uh, at that time, and this was before George Romney's uh, brainwash comment, but uh, at that time he uh, said, you know, he said, I wouldn't want to run against uh, George Romney. He said, I can't figure that fellow. He said, you know, he's just too good. And uh, he said, how many of your pals, you know, every time that they have a decision to make, go out and fast for 48 hours? <laughs> and it wasn't that he criticized it, it was just that he couldn't read him. He couldn't understand why, uh, why he did what he did. But he said, give me good old Barry. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'll never leave the Oval Office. <laughs> this gentleman. To what extent did he uh, realign the information uh, gathering agency got to the faulty information well, as you know, they, they formed this, uh, this uh, committee, which Bob Kennedy was on, and uh, General Krulak of the Marine Corps, and uh, some other people in the Pentagon. And then uh, this was really the impetus that got the uh, Defense Communications Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency formed, in which they got rid of the separate, I mean, they didn't get rid of it, but they 
put everything together and all the different services so they all worked as one in these different areas which is one of the great things that Bob McNamara has done in other words it cuts down the duplication you don't have somebody reporting in in some manner on, on the Navy uh, on the same information and in a different way on the same information in the Air Force this was part of it and it really was once again the personnel uh, factor you've got to go in and see who's doing the job and they found out who it was and the people who didn't do well they got them out of there this gentleman Well, this gentleman asked what changes he would have made in his administration has been re-elected, you mean as far as personnel? I think that, uh, number one, uh, he thought uh, the people he had the greatest confidence in in his administration were number one, his brother Bob, and number two, uh, Bob McNamara. These are the two people that he, as he said, how can you fault McNamara? So we go to these uh, meetings, these National Security Council meetings, or the small ones, and we go to a cabinet meeting, and McNamara is taking everything down as, the, as all is going on. And when he walks out of the office, these are implemented immediately. He said the rest of the cabinet members sit, and he said then they wait till, wait till the transcript has been brought out, which maybe takes an hour, or whatever, two hours, and it's delivered to them, and then they make their actions. And he said, but McNamara is right on top of it, has it going, and he said he's just, uh, in his opinion, a great administrator. Uh, Schlesinger said that Dean Russ was going to be replaced after the campaign. Do you have any knowledge on that? Well, um, <coughs> this is one of the uh, issues that I had in my book with Jackie Kennedy, because, uh, and uh, I have great respect for Arthur Schlesinger as a historian, uh, as long as he's not involved in the history at the time. Uh, <laughs> I uh, had a uh, great respect as an intellect and as a very humorous individual. I mean, he's really a brilliant man. But uh, I don't think he was as close to the picture as, uh, as he, he seems to imply. And I, I, I'll give you the incident, which I took out of my book. And uh, we all agree this is within the family here. So that, uh, <laughs> but it was a case we, uh, a fellow named Jim Reed, who was the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, and myself were swimming with the President on a Saturday morning. We came out of the pool at the White House, and one of the Secret Service men handed the President, this was after the uh, missile crisis, I handed the president a paper, and there was an article in there, supposedly an interview given by uh, Arthur Schlesinger to a columnist, in which it implied that the president had been looked like he was going to go another direction, but then after discussing with Arthur Schlesinger the whole issue, he decided to take the point that Arthur Schlesinger had taken. And uh, as the president said, that goddamn Artie. And uh, he wasn't being profane, but he was really just saying that the, the, the guts to think that his advice to me, he doesn't have any idea about maybe the 10 or 20 or 30 people that have given him information and advice. And he said, I'll tell you who he's going to advise. He's going to advise Jackie on the historical significance of the furniture that goes in the White House, period. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I don't, I don't think after that incident, I don't really think that he was privy to the, uh, the major decisions the president made. What about Galvin? Uh, what do you mean? I think that the, he had great influence. The president had uh, respected and admired uh, Ken Galbraith. In fact, uh, Ken Galbraith was a uh, somebody you saw socially. He would be up at the uh, Cape. He'd be down in Florida. He was with the president on many occasions. Gentlemen? Yes. Was Dean Russ considered the first choice for the Secretary of State? I really don't know. I really don't. I couldn't answer that question. This gentleman? Uh, you mentioned the great confidence the president had in his brother Robert. Uh, how do you account for the different images the two men put across? Is there an essential difference in their character? And would you recommend Robert as a possible presidential candidate? Do you feel, you feel he had the same qualities as his brother had? Well, this gentleman asked, uh, that I, that I, which I stated, that uh, the president uh, thought highly of uh, Robert Kennedy, but he said they're so entirely different. What the, I attribute, and I hope I'm paraphrasing it correctly, uh, what did I attribute to this difference to them and what I recommend them as somebody, uh, you know, for the presidency? Well, number one, uh, I don't think two people are alike, and I think if you took any, at least in my opinion, if you took anybody, they'd come off second best to John Kennedy. I mean, it's just somebody that I really, uh, if you can say idolize, as my wife used to say, I know exactly the pegging the order, there's the president and then the rest of the family. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the, he, I thought he was uniquely endowed. I'll say this about Bob Kennedy. Bob Kennedy has, he's very bright, 
He's got tremendous courage. Uh, he is a, a man who knows the use of power. He uh, uses, in my opinion, he uses it rightly. I think he's got excellent judgment, and in my opinion, I think he's the best man on the national scene today. I don't know if that answers your question. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's see this gentleman here. Do you think the President Kennedy was chosen to not quit it for this gentleman asked whether, he, whether I thought President Kennedy would have uh, chosen Clark Clifford as the Secretary of Defense. Uh, number one, I think you would have gone all the way with Bob McNamara, so I don't think you would have... Uh, I don't think so, and this isn't in any way... Uh, uh, because I don't think you would have been in this situation. I think Clark Clifford, who I have great respect for and is uh, a very, very fine person, I think he was pulled in there for other reasons than a total administrator of the department. I think he was pulled in there to try to settled peace between the Congress and the Defense Department at a time when the President needs all the support he can get. This gentleman? Uh, what was President Kennedy's long-range views about China and the future of Asia and the, why he didn't buy the domino theory? Well, uh, I just don't, I don't think that he wanted to get us involved and uh, but that's, I really, uh, I'd be really kind of hedging my position here if I tried to say because I really don't know. This gentleman? Uh, can you compare the qualities of Kennedy and uh, President Johnson and Johnson? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, this gentleman asked that I compare the qualities of President Johnson and President Kennedy, and I think that you're all as qualified as I am. <laughs> I wonder if I might ask another question, that is that Jack Vaughn has reported that the number of applications for the Peace Corps has almost fell in half this year as compared to previous years. And there doesn't seem to be the same enthusiasm for that project, which was a very fond well, project. I, I think uh, this was. I mean, the gentleman said there's not as much enthusiasm for the Peace Corps now as there was uh, when President Kennedy was alive. In fact, uh, I think Bob Kennedy was said the other day in San Francisco that the uh, applications for the Peace Corps have fallen off by 40 percent. But I... Uh, I think this is understandable. I think John Kennedy really communicated with the young people of this country. I think that you all felt that you had something, you know, that you felt he understood your problems and he appreciated your thoughts. In fact, he made an amazing statement after he was president. He said, do you realize that I am the first man to have been educated, I'm the first president of the United States to have been educated after World War I? And that was true. In other words, everybody else who held the presidency had received their undergraduate education before World War I. And he said, and even now, I feel that uh, I'm, uh, you know, limited in my uh, knowledge of what's going on because my education was, you know, before World War II. And uh, so he had this feeling and rapport with the youth, and I, uh, I think that it's difficult for you to have it with President Johnson. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you, maybe you all have it. <laughs> <laughs> this young lady. Uh, the question is, what was John Kennedy's opinion of uh, Nikita Khrushchev on a personal level? It was really very interesting when he went over to, uh, and he met, I believe it was in Vienna, uh, where he met uh, Khrushchev, and he was so gun-shy that uh, this fellow was going to try to upstage him, that uh, he said, God, he said, I was, um, I was walking in there and watching from every corner to see what this fellow was going to do, because I just didn't, because I knew he looked on me as a young man, and therefore he tried to upstage me in some way and treat me as a young kid. And so he worked with him and he said that uh, the only thing uh, that he uh, got, they were seated and they, uh, he had a, Khrushchev had a medal on his chest and the president was trying to make light conversation and he went through the interpreter and he said, uh, uh, asked the premier what that uh, medal is there and they uh, came back as the peace medal and the president said, well, tell him that I hope he keeps it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he thought he was a really a tough, wary, practical politician. Are we running out of time here? No, we gentlemen. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Teddy Roosevelt both had influential positions in the Navy Department. I wonder when you were going to start your campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, there was something else going to come from that thing. That's the most flattering thing that's been said in a long while, so I won't even repeat it. Cause <laughs> now, I wanted to know one thing. Are you still a registered Republican? No, I'm not. It's amazing enough. I changed my registration in 65, really to help Bob Kennedy, and then, of course, you know, then uh, Bob Kennedy doesn't need my help anymore. <laughs> this, 
young lady back there? Uh, this lady asked me the relationship between Kennedy and Adlai Stevenson. Uh, actually, uh, during the, uh, in the during the time when Adlai Stevenson was running for the presidency in '56, John Kennedy traveled with uh, Adlai Stevenson. At that time, there was no rapport at all. In fact, he told of going to the Notre Dame football game, and they sat next to him, and he said they didn't say a word for the whole game because Adlai Stevenson really wasn't interested in the game. And he was there for political reasons, and John Kennedy was fascinated with the game, and so they just, there was no real communication. But then as time passed, when he became president, then he had really great uh, rapport with Adlai Stevenson. In fact, Adlai Stevenson was uh, around uh, an awful lot of the time. This gentleman? What kind of person was Dave Powers? What kind of relationship? Dave, uh, a gentleman asked me, what kind of a person was Dave Powers? Dave Powers was a warm, outgoing, lovable Irishman. He really was a... Uh, Dave Powers made the president happy just by uh, being around. He had a joke, every day he had some new joke, or he had the same old joke told differently. I mean, he, <laughs> was, uh, he just was a, is and was a wonderful guy. Uh, during the campaign in 1960, when the president was confronted with religious issues, could you more or less uh, give us a, a short briefing as to, you know, how the president came to decide to really confront the American public with the religious issue when he actually came out and stated his position clearly instead of hedging around? What were the political factors involved? Well, this gentleman asked me in, in 1960 when the president uh, was campaigning in the primaries, I guess it was the primaries, and also mostly in the primaries, I think it was all settled by the time he got the administration. Uh, what was, uh, why did he come right out and speak to the, uh, to the religious issue, which he did, uh, and what were the political ramifications that forced him to do it? Uh, I just think it was innate in the president's personality that uh, he just, you know, he really uh, was honest and he communicated directly, and this was his way. In other words, this was an issue that had to be treated. Is he, he, I think it was down in Houston, he spoke before the, uh, I think it was the uh, bishops, the, uh, one of the, Presbyterian or the Protestant bishops groups down there. He spoke to them at that time. He laid the case right on the line. And the big issue was that the Pope was going to come over and uh, influence him on his decision. And he said, I'd just like somebody to find one decision that the Pope would uh, come over and try to issue, I mean, influence me on. And I can remember uh, I was in West Virginia. And so, I mean, to answer your question, I just felt, I think he felt it was a forthright thing to do. But I, I have to tell a story. I was in West Virginia campaigning in the primary, and I got in a cave. It was a coal cave, and this was a, one of these the caves that you go in. It was run by uh, this uh, one operator, and he had four fellows working with him. And it was a, you'd go in on a vein, and there was, there was a, the opening was about that high, and it went back in about 300 feet. And the, the, the full height of the thing was about that high. So you went in on your stomach. And you got back there and you were crouching all the time. And these fellows spent their, I mean, there was a, at that time I was about 42. And uh, this there was a fellow there that was a year younger than, than I am. And he looked like he was old enough to be my father. They spent all their time in this, you know, just digging out a living in that cave. And they put a blast off. And uh, so we were out about 150 feet away from the blast. And we were sitting there and I was campaigning for John Kennedy. And one of the miners said, he said, what do we want Kennedy over here for? He said, if he comes over here, he's going to bring the Pope over here. And the fellow said, I don't give a goddamn. He said, if the Pope can get us some jobs, get him over here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll have just one more question. Time is running out. Gentlemen. Hi, uh, I read your book. Good for you. <laughs> Yes. And uh, you made a whole big skit and everything, and you had it all arranged, and it was going to be you know, a real vaudeville, and uh, it was really great, and you liked, and you liked it a whole lot, and you showed the script to Kennedy, and uh, Professor Kennedy, he didn't like it or cut out a lot. And no, no, we were... They were, this was Saturday night before the election, I believe it was on Monday in Wisconsin, the, uh, Wisconsin, the primary. And there were four of us who were going to go on, and uh, on the television, this was in a half-hour program that was going all over the state. And we'd been in the uh, bar having a few beers before, and we were planning exactly how this program would go, because we thought the president would be busy, you know, and it wouldn't have a chance to get it pulled together. 
Well, as it turned out, uh, each one of us was introducing the other fellow and really going into his whole business record. So that, in other words, here's uh, John Galvin in the insurance business down in Chicago, and then they had me in the construction business in California, and going on quite a bit about the people who are going to be on this show, and not too much about the candidate. And uh, when uh, John Kennedy took one look at it, he said, uh, I know we're trying to help you fellas out in business, but it's not tonight. <laughs> I think that's about all the time all we right. have. Thank you very much. On behalf much. of the Associated Students, I want to thank you very much, Mr. Fay, for sharing the